Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at RIA taking a look at the biggest not-a-joke pistol I think I've ever seen. This is an 1896 Maxim Silverman pistol in 455 Webley, and this thing is an absolute beast. It is huge. Uh, it is also one of only three Maxim Silverman pistols known to exist, possibly three ever made total. Now, the backstory to this I have covered, I think, fairly well in a previous video about one of the other Maxim Silverman pistols, a rather smaller one chambered for the 765 Borchardt cartridge. So if you want the whole story, go check out that video, which I will link at the end of this one and in the description text. The short version is uh, Hiram Maxim hires a German guy named Louis Silverman uh, to act as his factory manager, his factory supervisor. Silverman's a fairly talented engineer, and comes up with this pistol probably on his own. It's patented under uh, both names, uh, Maxim and Silverman. Max, Hiram Maxim is, has a massive ego, and is a huge self-promoter. And we never hear about this pistol in any of Maxim's own writing. He never talks about a collaboration with Silverman on something like this. He talks about Silverman when he has to. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if this had been Hiram Maxim's idea, we would know all about it, because Hiram Maxim would make sure that no one ever forgot it. However, it looks like it wasn't. It looks like it was Louis Silverman's idea. And so Maxim was never really willing to have the Maxim Nordenfelt uh, company devote any substantial resources to this. And so while it was a particularly promising design, it never actually got developed, and we end up with only three of them probably ever made. So uh, let me take this one apart after I compare it to some like sort of reasonably normal sized pistols to show you just how massive this thing is. All right, so here's a standard 1911. Here's a Maxim Silverman. But wait, this is the small Maxim Silverman, not the 455 version. That is the 455 Maxim Silverman. And it basically just dwarfs a 1911. This thing weighs in at 1.64 kilos. That's about 3.6 pounds. Um, it's about 14 inches overall in length. It is, in fact, heavier and larger than uh, a Mars automatic pistol, normally a strong contender for most ludicrously huge pistol ever. The thing's just a beast. It has a very steep grip angle. Um, and what's interesting is because of the the amount of weight in this, like it, it pivots right about here, which maybe sounds like a good thing, but it's kind of not. Um, this gun bounces around quite a lot. There's some speculation that the rear sight is up here in the middle of the gun instead of on the back, because the gun is just kind of intrinsically kind of hard to hold steady. And it's a lot more obvious to see that when your rear sight's back here. It's a little bit easier to keep a sight picture when the rear sight's sort of at that balance point, and you only have to deal with the front sight moving around. Now, there is no manual safety on the Maxim Silverman. We have a trigger with some nice serrations on it there, uh, but no other external controls except for a magazine catch. Pull that back, and we can. There we go. Now, there's a bit of a conundrum here as to exactly what ammunition this pistol is designed around, because nothing quite actually works 100%. So there are two versions of 455 Webley service ammunition that would have existed when this pistol was being made. There's Mark I and Mark II. The Mark I ammunition is relatively long. It's like 37 millimeters overall length, and it has a 22 millimeter long case. The chamber in this pistol is 21 millimeters deep, so it will not chamber the Mark I ammunition. In addition, Mark I ammunition is too long to actually fit in the magazine. It's, it sits up nose high, and you can't load more than one or two rounds. The Mark II ammunition has an 18 millimeter long case. So the chamber wasn't cut for either one of these. Uh, Mark II ammo is actually a bit short to fit in the magazine, and doesn't feed reliably. The one cartridge that will... well, I should say, but the Mark II ammo will fire. Putting a, uh, an 18 millimeter case into a 20 millimeter long chamber works. It's not ideal, but it works fine. And uh, one of the previous owners of this pistol, uh, Jeffrey Sturgis, actually shot it, and reports that, <laughs> not surprisingly, recoil is quite mild uh, with Mark II ammo. 
the one cartridge that does fit and feed properly from the magazine is a commercial variation that is basically the short cartridge case, but a long bullet to give the whole cartridge a longer overall length. So that will... Um, or I'm sorry, it's the long cartridge with, the short, with a shorter bullet. So that will fit and feed nicely in the magazine, but it won't chamber and fire because the case is longer than the chamber. So I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there, but it's a prototype pistol. Perhaps he was making his own ammunition at the time and came up with a cartridge that he thought was going to be ideal. Anyway, that's the magazine. Hold seven rounds of whatever it is you put in it. And by the way, there is no there are no special features on here to accommodate the rim of the ammunition. Uh, but because of the steep angle of the grip, uh, the rim actually doesn't really get in the way. There's no chance of rim lock because of how far each cartridge is staggered behind the one uh, above and below. There's a lanyard ring on the front of the grip, which you would think would get in the way, except that the grip is so long that it really just totally doesn't. On the left side we have cutouts in the grip panel so that you can see how much ammunition is in the magazine. That's common to all the Maxim Silvermans. All right, let me go ahead and pull this apart and show you how it works. The first step here is to pull this screw out. This is what keeps the dust cover uh, connected to the bolt. The dust cover is more than just a dust cover here. It also adds reciprocating mass to help the uh, gun cycle open a little bit more slowly. And it is the piece that connects the bolt itself to the striker, basically. So once I take this off, I can no longer cock the bolt because it's this lug locking into that hole in the bolt that allows me to actually pull the bolt back. The next step in disassembly is simply to unscrew this guy. You'll see how this works in just a moment. So I can pull this out. There we go. There's that. And then we can drop the bolt out. So the receiver of the gun, the frame of the gun, is just a tube with almost no features. It has that lug for the ejector, and that's pretty much it. The way the trigger mechanism works is when you pull the trigger, this little uh, lug pushes up, and it is going to push up on this lever. So when it pushes this up, the back end of the lever goes down. And inside the bolt, the firing pin here, which is connected to this striker cap at the back, this is sitting inside the bolt being held by that lever. So when the so when the trigger pushes this up, it allows the striker to snap forward, protrude out the bolt face, and fire the round. Now when this cycles, there's no obvious disconnector here, but what happens is if you are holding the trigger down, that uh, trigger protrusion stays up, and the bolt runs into the face right here of that sear lever runs into the trigger protrusion, and so the trigger can't do anything. Once you release the trigger, that protrusion comes down, and then it can snap under, come under this lever where it can fire again. So it has a semi-auto disconnector without actually needing an extra part. It's a very clever, very efficient design. Uh, the same thing goes for the spring. It's got one spring that functions as both the main recoil spring and also the striker spring. So a uh, total number of parts in this is something like 17. I mean, you compare this to some of the other really complicated, uh, difficult to make pistols that were on the market in the 1890s, and it's remarkably simple and efficient. Um, one other thing to point out here, we have a little tiny pin this is the ejector. So it's a floating ejector, and it sits in the bolt right here. And when it goes all the way forward, it punches the case out. Normally it will sit like that, flush with the breech face. When the bolt cycles backwards, this track is running over that lug, and that lug hits the ejector pushes it forward and causes the case to jump out of the gun at the appropriate point in the bolt's travel. Note that there is a leather buffer pad uh, in the 455 version. That's not present in either of the other two examples of the 
the Silverman pistols, uh, but presumably necessary to help cushion the blow of this. The, the big downfall of the Maxim Silverman pistol is that it was it is a simple blowback gun. So when you fire, this just all cycles backward uh, with inertia and that spring and the weight of all of these moving components being the only things to delay the opening of the breech. And it's not really enough. Um, the smaller caliber pistols, the one in, in Borchardt caliber and the one that was basically Borchardt necked up to 8.5 mm, uh, they had to do some things like add gas vent holes for safety, and they added uh, like hesitation um, delaying springs to the back of the receiver. They never did that to the 455, possibly because the weight of the components was enough that they didn't need to, or they just didn't get around to it. But the gun was fundamentally chambered for a cartridge that was too powerful for its simple operating mechanism. It is very cool to get a chance to take a look at this, yet another of the Maxim Silverman pistols. It is really quite impressive. And it's really a shame that Silverman wasn't able to follow up on this project. It's a, a fundamentally good design, just hampered by poor choice of cartridge. Had Silverman taken his idea, scaled it down a little bit, and chambered it for something like the 32 ACP cartridge, which granted didn't exist when he designed this, but that's a, a pistol that could have actually worked. Um, the 38 or 380 ACP probably could have worked pretty well with this as, uh, also. And in a, if it had been designed around a cartridge that was light enough to use a simple blowback system, this could have been an economical and and simple gun to build, like it could have been a thing uh, in the late 1890s. Unfortunately, the combination of an unfortunate choice of cartridge to begin with, which is understandable, this is early in the days of self-loading pistols, uh, combined with the inability of Silverman to get any significant support and backing for the idea, because basically Hiram Maxim was a jerk, mean that uh, it's uh, only it's left to only be here on forgotten weapons. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.